Today we are studying the bone radius. It is the lateral bone of forearm. Upper end has a disc shaped head. Lower end is expanded with a projection styloid process and in between lies the shaft of the radius. For side determination, upper end it is a disc shaped head and the lower end is expanded with a styloid process laterally. In the lower end, anterior surface is in form of a thick ridge whereas on the posterior surface it presents four grooves for the extensor tendons. On the lower end, there is a tubercle on posterior surface. It is called as the dorsal tubercle of Lister. The sharpest border of the shaft is the medial border. So the given bone belongs to the right side. Now the features of the radius, upper end. The head of radius, it is shaped like a disc. Covered with hyaline cartilage. It is concave superiorly. This surface articulates with the capitulum of the humerus superiorly. And the circumference of the head articulates with the ulna. And is surrounded by annular ligament. Thus forming the superior radio ulnar joint. Now the neck. It is the constricted part of the bone between the head and the shaft. It is covered by a narrow lower margin of the annular ligament. Head and neck are free from the capsular attachment and can rotate freely within the socket. Quadrate ligament is attached to the medial part of the neck. <coughs> Radial tuberosity <coughs> Radial tuberosity, it lies just below the medial part of the neck. It has a rough posterior part and a smooth anterior part. Biceps tendon is attached to the rough posterior part of the radial tuberosity. Now the shaft, it has three borders, anterior border, it extends from the anterior margin of radial tuberosity to the styloid process of the radius below. It is oblique in the upper half and vertical in the lower half. The oblique line is called as the anterior oblique line. The posterior border, it is well demarcated only in the middle one third. Posterior oblique line is in the upper oblique part of the posterior border. The medial border or the interosseous border it is sharpest among all the three borders. It extends from the radial tuberosity above to the posterior margin of the ulnar notch below. Interosseous membrane is attached to the lower three-fourth of the interosseous border. Surfaces Anterior surface this lies between anterior border and the interosseous border. Nutrient foramen usually opens in the upper part and is directed upwards. The posterior surface, it lies between the posterior border and the interosseous border. The lateral surface it lies between the anterior border and the posterior border. The lower end now, it has five surfaces. Anterior surface, it is in the form of a thick prominent ridge. Radial artery is usually palpated against this surface. 
posterior surface presents four grooves for extensor tendon and dorsal tubercle of Lister lies lateral to the oblique groove. It is a prominent tubercle on the posterior surface. The medial surface is occupied by a ulnar notch for the head of the ulna. Lateral surface is elongated downwards to form the styloid process. Inferior surface, it bears a triangular area for scaphoid bone and medial quadrangular area for the lunate bone. These surfaces take part in the forming the wrist joint. Now going to the attachments. Supinator muscle is inserted into the upper part of the lateral surface. Pronator teres inserted in the middle of the lateral surface. Brachioradialis is inserted into the lower part of the lateral surface just above the styloid process. Flexor digitorum superficialis originates from the anterior oblique line. Flexor pollicis longus originates from the upper two-third of the anterior surface. Pronator quadratus is inserted on the anterior surface on the lower part into a triangular area. Abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis arise from the posterior surface. Now the tendons, extensor tendons in the groove on the posterior surface, the first groove between the crest of the anterior border and the styloid process, it gives the passage of the tendons abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. The second groove which lies between the styloid process and the dorsal tubercle, there we have the two tendons passing that is the extensor carpi radialis longus and extensor carpi radialis brevis. Third is a oblique groove which is medial to the dorsal tubercle. We have the tendon passing that is the extensor pollicis longus. Then the fourth groove which is on the medial aspect that is the tendon extensor digitorum and the extensor indices which pass through this fourth groove. Now going to the ossification. Primary center appears along during the eighth week of intrauterine life and it has two secondary centers which appear on the upper end during the fourth year and fuses with the shaft by around the eighteenth year of life and the second secondary center appears in the lower end during the second year of life and fuses with the shaft during the twentieth year of life. Now the joints formed by this bone Superiorly, it articulates with the capitulum to form the shoulder, sorry, the elbow joint. Then at the head, the circumference, it articulates with the ulna to form the superior radio ulna joint. <coughs> then at the interosseous borders, we have the middle radio ulna joints. Then at the ulnar notch, we have the inferior radio ulnar joint and on its inferior surface, it is forming the wrist joint. Now going to the applied aspects, fall on the outstretched hand leads to the fracture which is called as the Colles fracture. Here there is the fracture occurring 2 cm above the distal end of the radius with its upward and posterior and displacement of distal segment which leads to the dinner fork deformity. So this type of fracture is called as the Colles fracture whereas the reverse of the Colles fracture is called as the Smith's fracture. Here there is distal segment which is displaced forward. Another applied aspect related to radius is the subluxation of head of radius which is seen in the pulled elbow 
which when there is the sudden powerful jerk on the hand of a child which may dislodge the head of the radius from the grip of annular ligament so this causes the subluxation of head of the radius